This is Soccer Today, live on SPN Radio. Your new live show about the beautiful game in all its glory. With Dwayne Rollins and Kevin Laramie. Give us a call. Studio line 929-477-3874. MLS, EPL, La Liga, Champions League, all is fair game. Powered by the Sports Podcasting Network. Visit us at sportspodcastingnetwork.com. And welcome to the penultimate episode of Soccer Today's Pilot Period. Uh, we're looking to go uh, near daily on uh, June the 6th, Kevin. Kevin Laramie joins me as always. I am Dwayne Rollins for those that don't know. Kevin, how are you today? I am doing great, Dwayne. It's, well, getting close to June 10th, isn't it, where the Euros will be starting. We have the Copa coming up, the Champions League final on Saturday. And Javinko hasn't been chosen for the Italian national team. A lot, a lot of topics today on soccer, Dwayne. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that is going to be our tease question. We call it our tease question today, which you're welcome to call us and talk about if you want or any other topic that is on your beautiful minds out there today. 929-477-3874 is that number to call us in. The number, the call is, uh, the board will be open for calls at about 1230. In the meantime, we have Elsa Blasis on to talk about the snub of Javinko or the justified decision based on fit. Depends on your perspective, Kevin, and we talked about that yesterday on Two Salt Suits, but Elf's going to join us today to talk a little bit about that and also just break down Italy in a general sense and and talk about their hopes heading into Euro 2016. Um, Good time there. We've had Elf on uh, on the the rest of the story show before. He's uh, For those that don't know that are American maybe or not at least uh, from Canada, that I guess not from Canada can can be American or otherwise, but if you're not Canadian, you might not know Elf, but he's a longtime voice of Syria here in this country and uh, knows his stuff so this is a good guest he should be coming on the line in about 13 minutes what, what, what are your thoughts today Kevin what's on the top of your mind right now though well um, uh, it's quiet right and it's been um, busy Wednesdays in MLS for the last few weeks so today it's actually a little quiet for me and there's no post game show tonight so I'm more contemplating which side of Madrid am I going to choose or cheer or or just have emotions for am i gonna have emotions for any madrid side on saturday i don't know it's a question i was really interested last week with the europa league final Dwayne, between uh well uh liverpool and sevilla sevilla won for the third straight year but liverpool you know the the whole story of the the former giants the former darling of the entire world of soccer coming back into prominence and the club story and it's all oh, his fifth straight defeat in the final all those storylines are interesting but now we're talking about madrid Atletico, the former winners of Europa League, the former minnows of Spain, in a way. Now they're battling their arch rival for the supremacy of Europe. It's quite an intriguing philosophy clash on the pitch, too, because you have the the money, the wallet, the, the, the bank filled with gold of Real Madrid versus Simeone, defense and misfits, a, a gang of misfits fighting against the richest club in the world so it's like literally david versus goliath on saturday it, to me there's only one choice of what side the madrid the choice you can either go with the people or you can go with the club of uh, of the elites and uh i tend to tend to air towards the side of the people and i know i just irritated a lot of real madrid fans when i said that <laughs> and, and we all know their history i'm not going to go too far back on the history and who may have cheered for him back in back in the day because it's not their fault who cheered for them but uh nonetheless if you ever travel in madrid or in a sort of the north eastern or sort of western part of, of spain you'll you'll find that atletico madrid is a massively popular team and uh real madrid the team that the tourists watch but uh nonetheless uh it will be sort of a blue collar versus white collar riches versus poorness uh Goliath, David, whatever you want to spin it on the week. I love the Champions League final, though, regardless the pomp and circumstance around it, just the, the fact that it is the, the Super Bowl. I hate that analogy, but the Super Bowl of soccer. <laughs> Come on, the Super I, Bowl is the Champions League of football. Exactly. That's, that's the better way to put it. But it certainly is um, – you know, a game that brings everyone together and out in the pubs and, and whatever. I'll, I'll be uh, just the way the game falls this year. I'll be actually at a League One Ontario game immediately following it. So I will uh, be near the stadium there down by the League One Ontario. So I'm going to support the ultimate in big football. And then I'm going to go down the street and I'm going to support, support the ultimate and support local football right immediately after that, Kevin. 
I will be on my way to seeing Montreal versus the LA Galaxy Stad Saputo Saturday, May 8, 28th. Uh, always interesting when the Galaxy are in town when you have a chance to see uh, Keen and all that. Well, actually, no, because they're all gone to the Heroes. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see the Galaxy on Saturday right after this game. I'm still not sure, Dwayne, yet if I'm going to watch that game in the command center or if I'm going to go watch that game somewhere close to the stadium. H having to work after and cover a game... Unfortunately, there won't be any alcoholic beverage included this year while I'm watching the Champions League final, but I'm going to find a way to enjoy the game anyways. Ah, you don't need alcohol to enjoy football? That's, uh, that's nonsense there. No, I, I'll be in the same boat <laughs> because I'm working immediately after that. But uh, certainly there is um, an element of, uh, of pub culture around that game. That's what I always – we talked about this before. I used to love – sort of when it was a bit underground here in North America, and it yeah. was always in the midweek on the Wednesday, and, and we'd sneak That's out of true. work and go watch the game in the pub, and it was always like you'd walk past, like, empty pub, empty pub, empty pub. One full pub. pub. to the rim. And keep, <laughs> yeah. And every, people that didn't know the sport would be walking past this pub going, what the hell is going on in there? What are these people doing? And I think actually, to be serious, that probably brought people into the sport in North America because they'd be like, that looks like it's fun and I want to be part of that part, part of that crowd. It, it, soccer fans in North America, for better or worse, have always been party people, the people that are sort of uh, a little bit um, crazy at times. So they, that's a lot of fun there. And uh, I love the Champions League. As I said, it's been uh, – Many years that it's been one of the pinnacle days of my year of my sporting calendar, and I look very much forward to Saturday. Um, predictions? I'll get your prediction. We'll talk a bit more about the Champions League in the call-in process if anyone wants to talk about it or after, after we talk to Elf. But do you have any predictions right now, Kevin? Ooh, prediction. That's a good question, Dwayne. I'm looking at a club like uh, Atletico Madrid. With defensively, they're able to achieve results that we expect, but that we don't necessarily think is possible. We always... Not necessarily play them down, but we're always count them as underdogs. So we're always like, yeah, they did great. They were defensively, they stopped Barca. Defensively, they stopped Bayern. But can they stop Madrid? You know, maybe we have to give some credit to Atletico to be able to pull off upset after upset. The season they had in La Liga, yeah, they didn't win. They finished third behind uh, Real and Barca. But still, Atletico were able to go blow for blow in a long season which is a little more difficult. In a knockout stage like the Champions League, they were able to get the advantages when they could, uh, count on Griezmann double when they have to, to pull off an upset victory on the road. Or, you know, those type of performances by this club have been repeated after and after and after. And those performances are like, it's Simeone, it's the team, it's not individual player. Look, Dwayne, Fernando Torres is playing in that team. I mean, they are the Champions League final. So, just tactically, I think a Simeone is way above a, a Zidane. Where Zidane has more of a motivator, more of a the respect and admiration of the players and they want to play for him. Simeone has an understanding of the game that's, yes, Zidane's understanding of the game is, we understand, it's great. He played the game for two decades in the highest level. I understand that. But on the coaching side of things, Simeone might be right now the best coach on this planet, the best tactician, the best manager of men on this planet. So to find a way to beat him, I don't think Zidane has it in him yet. I think Simeone is the best manager in the world right now. But I also question, I don't know whether Simeone could, could manage Real Madrid, though, like put aside the rivalry no. and all that sort of jazz and just sort of look at it in big versus small terms. And Zidane is a guy that I think, <sighs> had to manage a club like that. You the big egos, the big personalities, the you know, the the superstarness of it, whatever. Like you can't really have a guy like Simeone go and yell at them and make them like pee themselves on if they don't do what they're supposed to do, right? Like that's not necessarily how you manage Real Madrid. And I think that is in many ways an interesting contrast between the managerial styles there and, and what works for different clubs is not always the same, right? So, uh, but I, I love Simeone. I, I joked once he is the man that every heterosexual male wishes they were, right? <laughs> He's just like got that suave and the macho-ness and, and the toughness about him and all that sort of stuff. That uh, He's, he's kind of like the quintessential... Yes, I was going to say, Dwayne, he's not sorry to be a man. He doesn't feel bad about being a man. He doesn't feel bad about having an attitude, about having some bad days and can and be angry. He's not apologetic about 
himself. And uh, that's refreshing in a world where we're uh, shamed on whatever we're doing. Yeah, yeah. In terms of, I asked you for the prediction, so it's only fair that I provided as well. And as I said, after so, we talk so, to Elf, we'll, we'll probably do this. So are, go ahead, Kevin. Are you a one percenter, Dwayne? Are you a one percenter, or are you with the ninety-nine percent? Well, I'm with the ninety-nine. There's no doubt about it. I, I've had a big crush on Atletico Madrid since I traveled to Madrid uh, a few years ago, and people are probably sick of me telling the story of how I was there the day they won the Europa League for the first time. Uh, in a long time uh, in, in 2010, so uh, it's, it's an old story for me. So I'll absolutely be chased. As soon as, uh, as soon as Manchester City got out of this competition, I was glad that Atletico Madrid was still in it, and uh, it would have been I, it, there wouldn't have been no no torn heart. There wouldn't have been any any question, you know, about my loyalties being torn and City made the final. But nonetheless, uh, Atletico has always served as, as a kind of a second choice for me in in, in Europe anyway. So. I will be cheering for Athletic Madrid just because I always cheer for Athletic Madrid in these situations. But even if I didn't have that kind of, you know, thin attachment, uh, I still think I'd be cheering for them simply because, A, I always cheer for second teams. You know, the second teams of the city, Espanol, uh, Athletic Madrid, Manchester Are you saying City? city? Uh, Are you, you saying City is the second team of Manchester? Oh, that's mean. You're saying that to your, your own historically club? Historically speaking. Historically <laughs> speaking. There's no doubt about it. I don't hide from that. That's part of what makes City – speak to me is the fact that they are behind that big behemoth of the thing that is uh, just a little outside in the suburbs there so that's that's always why why i uh cheer for the second teams of, of these cities so lots of fun stuff there but uh, in terms of my prediction i you know there is an element of destiny to, to atletico madrid this year do you not think and i kind of yeah i think they might finish the job i think they might get that one nil. i don't think it's going to be pretty but unless you love tactics, and I think tactical geeks are gonna love watching it, Letty, because they're so fascinating to watch how they can shut a team down. But I, I'm gonna go with one nil for Letty. That that is my prediction, legitimately beyond like emotional. I think that they they will have finished the job. It would be the most fitting result, wouldn't it? One nothing would be the literally the actually more fitting result for a team like Atletico. The way they play, the way that they don't have one superstar that scores four goals per game. But uh, his ego, I don't know if it's the best for the team. No, they have a team concept, players, misfits, rejects of other places gathered in Atletico or came back to Atletico or young players that were discovered from a, a difficult background, never given any chances. And when they come to Atletico, they flourish. That's the idea. And they won nothing against a giant like Real Madrid. Keeping that clean sheet, which is maybe more important for them than scoring a goal, is, well is literally what we call now Atletico and Simeone football. So that would just be probably what we would expect. People want to see fireworks. They would like to see a 4-3 type of game. But I don't expect this to happen with a team like Atletico that is going to work tactically to just shut down the midfield here. Yeah, my biggest cheering uh, thing, however, will be uh, not going into extra time because of my previously mentioned work commitments because I do not want to be watching the extra time of uh, the Champions League final on my phone while trying to do other things. That does not seem like it's good for production or good for what I'm supposed to be doing. And if anyone's listening to this that is involved in League One, I promise you I will pay full attention to my duties for League One, but I will be a tad bit distracted. And if there's a dead time, I'm going to damn well watch my phone, as you will be too. However, let's hope it ends before that because uh, there's, there's time for that to happen. Uh, Kevin, we are waiting for Elf now to call in, so uh, hopefully that will happen soon. But in the meantime, let's, let's sort of segue the conversation into – a bit of the Javinko stuff. And we talked about it, as I said yesterday, on Two Solitudes, about what we thought about this and, and whether we think that it is a snub or whether we think that this is just a, a situation for a for a fit, right? And, and hopefully, uh, I, I think that I believe it's, it's probably a bit of both and a bit of both. Still there, Kevin? Absolutely. No, I, I have to agree with you, Dwayne. But, you know, Javinko not being chosen or... In Europe or somewhere where Italy's really the, the the league they follow, it's the omission of Pirlo that gathers the attention of people. Like, oh, Pirlo's not being chosen and all that. But I have to agree with you. Jovinko not being picked is is a blow for Jovinko, but I think it just maybe shows what type of reputation MLS still has on the other side of the pond. All right, uh, Kevin, let's take a real quick break where we try and get Alpha on the line, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back and have that conversation. You are listening to the Sports Podcasting Network.
you're a big soccer fan, SPN is the place to be. USL Radio, NASL Nightcap, Two Solitude Soccer Podcast, Off the Woodworks, Ours is the Fury, 2S Extra, the rest of the story, SPN is the place to be. And we're back on soccer today. Kevin Laramie here, joined as always with Dwayne Rollins. So now, yep, yep, I'm still here, Kevin. All right, so we're sorry. Uh, go ahead, Kevin. No, I was just thinking. You know, Jovanko and the fact that he's not uh, picked with the Italian national team. Do you think it's going to affect Jovanko's play at all? I, no, I don't think it will. I, I think that uh, Javinko is, is a player that... Hello. Hello. Uh, Elf is joining us on the line now. Uh, Kevin, you're hearing Elf, okay? Hello. Hi. Yes, I can hear Hi, Elf. Elf. Uh, it's okay. Elf, sorry, sorry for the confusion on trying to connect you here. We're still working out the bugs on, on our live show, but we do appreciate your time. Elf is uh, joining us now to talk about the Italian national team. We were just talking about Javinko before you came on, Elf, and I'm wondering if we could just sort of start there and get your take on his omission from the Italian team's lineup? Well, uh, I, I, I was somewhat disturbed and, and angered by the omission um, and and obviously by the uh, statement that Antonio Conte made um, when he was uh, asked about, uh, uh, specifically about Javinko and, and uh, Andrea Pirlo being excluded from the uh, the 30-man list. Um, I think it shows uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, a lack of foresight. I, I mean, I think it's it's a, a, a best a misguided statement and, and at worst uh, an arrogant statement because uh, it illustrates a bit of a double standard because if you're going to make a case for a player like uh, Salvatore Sirigu, um, who is also playing abroad, uh, at PSG and who rarely got in a game uh, and yet there's space for him to be a reserve goalkeeper. Uh, I don't see how you can make the argument that uh, you can't find space for Sebastian Javinko, particularly after the the season that he had last year and uh, the, the, the 10 or 12 game run that he's had uh, so far this year in MLS. Um, you know, you can also make a case for another player who's playing abroad um, in uh, Pelé at uh, Southampton, um, and he hasn't necessarily had uh, what you might call uh, an outstanding season. Uh, 12 goals in 32 games is fairly mediocre for a player of his caliber, uh, but I guess because he's playing in the EPL, um, that he stands somewhat uh, up above the status that uh, Sebastian Jovinko has claimed. I, I don't, you know, I, I, I mean, I, 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 I gather that uh, Conte is making a case for the players that got him through qualifying and he's been loyal to them throughout. But uh, if we're looking at the last number of games that Italy has played, the the last four friendlies, they haven't won and the last two matches uh, that they played they uh, you know, they they conceded five goals and only scored twice Uh, and the last one, if you recall was a a 4-1 embarrassment against Germany, so I I think the team is in real trouble and if you can't make the case uh, for Sebastian Davinko to join you, um you know, on in in what looks like a really modest strike force at the moment, then uh, uh, then there's something to be said for that. Conte uh, said last year that players shouldn't be punished for trying new things to go into to different leagues, and said that he regretted himself not trying different leagues out. But yet a year later, we're seeing a completely different tune. Makes me wonder, with him outgoing, of course, whether he has full control of that lineup selection, or whether some of the the influences, maybe the more conservative, the more um, old world arrogant uh, influences within the Italian camp are, are in his ear and, and sort of causing influences there. Do you feel that this legitimately is, are the 30 players that he would go with, or do you think there's other influences involved here? I don't know about other influences. I, I, I think he's 
you know, I, th- I think he's loyal to a fault, and, and I know that uh, he obviously, uh, considering the, the, the player selection, uh, I, I think I know that he wants to uh, at least start the tournament uh, with a 3-5-2 formation. Obviously, he's going to he's going to have the you know the BBC group at, at the back with Bartelli, Bonucci, and, and, and Chiellini because um, he's had those players for many years uh, at club level. He knows them extremely well. Um, so I don't know that any other outside factors, uh, you know, would have come into the decision, particularly, uh, you know, for that defensive uh, group. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I hesitate to, to think what, you know, what this team um, will be faced with in, in their opening match against Belgium. And if we, we look at, you know, we talked about uh, a fairly modest uh, attacking group of players who are, aren't going to strike a lot of fear into a lot of defenses. When you come up, come up against Belgium and, you know, your starting center backs across from you are uh, Toby Alderweireld and Jan Vertonghen, who have spent a season at, at Tottenham, at a, a very uh, excellent season at, at, at Tottenham, um, I, I don't think they're going to get many opportunities, if, particularly if they're going to start uh, with uh, Pelé up front and one of either Insigne or Eder uh, or Zaza, neither of whom I, I really rate um, very highly, considering that uh, many of them have been part-time players at their club level. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think there are outside forces necessarily at play here. I really think that these are the players that he felt um, were uh, his his best uh, group through qualifying. But unfortunately, that group has not proven um, to be uh, as effective in in recent uh, friendlies as they as they were through the course of the uh, you know two and a half year qualifying stage. And you know, let, let's bring it into perspective. We're talking about uh, uh, a short term tournament here, um, and and not uh, a qualifying stage that, uh, that that took a couple a couple of years. So. You really want to be able to select players that are, are going to be durable and are, are going to be effective for you in a short-term tournament. I just Looking up and down this lineup, I just don't see that being the case uh, apart from you know, just a handful of players. Uh, and really, he, he lists, uh, w- which is a bit unusual because it's the first time I've seen this, but he, he lists wide players uh, as a separate group of players from um, midfielders and and, uh, and strikers, and I, I think the quality of the wide players um, is probably the best thing that Italy uh, has at, at the moment. The unfortunate thing is you can't play all six wide players at the same time. Uh, you can only play generally in a three-five-two. You're only going to play two of those players at, at any one time, uh, apart from some substitutions in the second half. But um, no, I, I I I really fear for for Italy, particularly in the uh, opening match against Belgium, for the reasons I mentioned. Alf, when you're looking at Italy and uh, Conte, he used the word consequences a lot in his statement the last two days ago when he talked about there's going to be consequences for the players. But he seemed to be talking about his staff and maybe himself. Is there a divide in the selection staff? Because if we can read between the lines, the way he was talking about the roster in that press release, he seemed a little worried. And the word consequences can almost be used to describe his job if Italy is not having the performances that some people expected them. What do you think that the the feeling in the selection room was? Is it a consensus or were there big arguments? I I can't. I I really don't know that there was necessarily. Um, uh, any great discussion over the the, the, the selections made? I, I, I just think that, uh, as I mentioned before, he is very loyal to this cast of players. Um, the the other concerning thing is that he's included two players who are far from full fitness, uh, and and players who haven't necessarily. Uh, being bright spots on their clubs and, and excelled this past season, and, and they are Tiago Mota and Ricardo Montolivo. Um, 
So in in calling these players into the 30 man squad, albeit it's it's a a larger um, squad than than most others, and he does have to trim it to 23 eventually. But to put your faith into these two players who are coming in with injuries and and may not even necessarily see uh, much time in training or even in the upcoming uh, exhibition match uh, says to me that that he's he you know he has invested a lot of uh, his um, time into these uh, into these players and he he wants them there because he re- he knows them and uh, he feels comfortable with them in the side and figures that there are going to be opportunities for for them to uh, you know to be able to 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 demonstrate on uh, uh, on the side, I, I frankly I don't see it. I mean I, I don't know why he would call in players that are you know far from full fitness, mind you. I, I guess a vast majority of these players coming off a, a, a you know laborious season at the, their respective clubs are are not necessarily all going to be uh, at full health. But when you do have players who are uh, in good form and in good health. Uh, and I'm speaking about uh, the, the MLS players. Um, it just it it boggles the mind. I mean, it just it confuses me as to why he would make uh, those types of decisions. So I, I really think um, that that these are decisions that were taken by uh, by him and him alone. I, I I don't know if there's necessarily a selection committee in place. I really think that uh, it, it's really the the Italian coach is is called. Um, the technical commissioner, uh, which is a, you know, quite a a, a, a title that, uh, that 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 gives for pomp and circumstance, but uh, but that's really who, who you know who he is, and in fact, in you know many other um, uh, you know many other uh, 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 newspapers and publications call you know, call the, uh, the national team coach, the, the selector. Uh, so it, it is, you know, it, it is very much a one man show. And, uh, and I think given the uh, selections that were made that uh, the, these were all um, uh, consensus in terms of uh, Antonio Conte being the primary um, selector of, of the squad. Alf, you mentioned Belgium and their first game versus Italy. You mentioned that you were worried for Italy in their first game. What outside of that first match intrigues you? What in the group is for Italy? Is it possible for them to come out of the group? Is it a worry that they're going to burn out in the group stage? Is Belgium the clear favorite for that group? I think uh, I think yes, Belgium is definitely the, the clear favorite, and the, and 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 as the two of them are, you know, uh, coming to a head in that uh, opening match uh, on June thirteenth, uh, I you know all I all I can think of is going back to a friendly that they played back in November, um, you know, when the Italians were. Um, very mediocre in a 3-1 loss uh, to the Belgians. And I, I can't see the result being any different, you know, uh, eight months down, uh, down the line. Uh, it's, it's just a, it's, it's a very, very complete squad, the, the, the Belgian team. And um, they have a lot of dynamic players uh, throughout that squad. And, and if we look, you know, beyond just that tandem uh, at the back, we're very effective. Um, we, you know, you have to look at uh, a player like uh, uh, Rajan Angolan in midfield, who had a, a sensational season at, at, at AS Roma in, in Serie A, and I know him quite well. I've, I've watched him very closely over the course of uh, the last number of seasons, and uh, you know, he's a player that Italy lacks in, in terms of his mobility his his fiery attitude his aggressive nature his striking ability from long distance um he, you know he's a player that can really carry uh, the belgians quite far and then up front you, you know all you need to look at is a player of the abilities of kevin de bruyne um who can 
give that Italian defense a lot of headaches. And if you if you're going to play with three at the back, um, those three players are going to have to be very mobile. They're going to have to be very alert and agile. And I'm wondering, given the the average age of those uh, three players, whether they're going to be able to withstand, you know, a player uh, with the, uh, the the skills and characteristics characteristics of a De Bruyne. So I really rate the Belgians quite highly. I, I think the, the the Swedes and uh, and the Republic of Ireland are more or less at the same level, maybe a notch below, but certainly at. Uh, um, at a superior level in, in terms of squad uh, squad depth and, uh, and you know and just uh, and just recent results um, that uh, that they too could be uh, a real um, you know a real headache for for Italy to to get through. I mean, I I, I you know I'll sound pessimistic, but I I can't see Italy just getting you know getting through this this uh, this round. I can't see them any better than a third place team in this group. And at least you have the best third place finishers to to look forward to, I suppose. Uh, Elf, um, Italy always an enigma in the major ch- t- ch- or major tournaments. You never do know quite what you're getting, but it certainly does seem like one of the. Uh, least um, positive sort of views heading into a tournament I've ever seen from Italian fans. Is that a fair, fair thing to say? Yeah. I mean, and it's all, you know, really it's based on, uh, as I said, the, uh, the most recent results in, in friendlies and uh, well, a number of factors, I think, uh, a, 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 you know, uh, the, the fact that Antonio Conte is leaving the national team at, at, at the end of the Euros um, to, you know, to take on the uh, the job at, at Chelsea, I think has left a lot of people uh, with with a bit of, bitter taste in their mouth. I think uh, uh, it was a foregone conclusion. He was going to leave um, at, at the end of the, the tournament, but uh, I, I think going ahead and actually making a commitment to a club team before you've actually even started the process of preparing for the, the European championships um, his uh, you know, has rubbed people the wrong way. And, and I think that uh, if, if he had stayed committed to uh, the, the national program and, uh, and perhaps have announced that he was going to leave, but not necessarily announced, you know, who he was going to, uh, um, join after the European Championships, it uh, might have, you know, left people with uh, uh, a different feeling. I, I don't know whether he was pressured necessarily by uh, Roman Abramovich and, and uh, the Chelsea executives to uh, to you know to make that announcement uh, when he did, but uh, it, I, I think it definitely factors into. Um, the kind of disillusion atmosphere, you know, around uh, Italian observers and supporters, and uh, and and really the, um, you know, the 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 greatest uh, um, disdain I think for him has come with the uh, announcement uh, of uh, the 30-man list, and and just the fact that you look up and down that uh, that selection and. There are very few players who can make uh, an immediate impact um, in, um, you know, in games that are crucial and, and, and critical um, for them to, to, to get results um, every five days. So, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, those, that combination of uh, things that I think has left a lot of people disturbed um quite frankly and uh i, I you know I, I don't know necessarily that you know the selection of Javinko on its own would have made uh, a, a great difference uh in the overall scheme of things but certainly it would have appeased um a lot of fans on this side of the atlantic perhaps because of the fact that we've followed him as close as we have and we know his abilities and all we need to, you know, to 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 do is go back to uh, you know a qualifying match back in October um, when he came on as a late second half substitute, uh, procured a, a goal for Italy in a, in a comeback uh, victory, um, and then as we know, 24 hours later he was on the field for TFC scoring a, a goal. So it's 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 that that uh, I, I think disturbs most people the, the that combination of things from the uh, 
um, from the fact that uh, you know Conte has already made plans beyond um, the European Championship. So is his focus necessarily on this squad? How much thought you know did he put into um, the selection of, uh, of, of players, uh, and how much is he, is he really um, willing and 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 able to to prepare this squad um, for the ultimate prize? And uh, and I think uh, the the thirty man um, selection list, uh, I, I think gives a lot of people, um, you know, just for, for those types of, uh, of discussions. Al, before we let you go, we'd be remiss if we didn't look at the tournament as a whole, putting Italian and Italy aside for a second. Uh, who do you think is going to be standing in the confetti when this is all said and done? Wow. It's, um, it's an interesting, uh, debate at the, at the moment. I think, uh, if you look across, the, uh, the the top end of uh, of teams, you obviously have to rate France as as the host. Um, we spoke briefly of, of Belgium, who come in as uh, as a top ranked nation as well, and of course Germany are the uh, um, the, the World Cup holders, um, and and always are a uh, you know an effective tournament team. Um, if, if, if I were to look beyond those three nations and, and consider, uh, you know, who would be a dark horse or who would be a team that, uh, would be at the, at the next level, um, you have to consider perhaps a, a nation like, uh, Turkey that has spent, uh, you know, some years, um, in, in kind of the wilderness, but are, are, Back in in the the top echelon, and uh, and I think it's a, a team with a, a lot of talent through their uh, uh, through their uh, lineup, and that can pose uh, some trouble, particularly in in their group. Uh, I also like, uh, I mean, I, I I do like the, uh, the the group of players that Roy Hodgson has has, has called in because he's got uh, a, the, the spine of, uh, of of the group from. Um, from Tottenham, who played uh, so well uh, this season, um, and uh, and I think we'll you know he'll have uh, an, an effective group of young, hungry uh, players who who can uh, take that nation. Um, I, I think uh, quite far. So I mean, o- you know, overall, if we're, if we're looking at uh, at challengers and contenders for the title, I mean, I think those are. The, the ones that uh, that I look at uh, first and foremost, uh, the, obviously with the expanded um, the expanded format uh, this year with 24 teams, there's so much more opportunity for um, you know for for teams that have been outsiders in in the past uh, to to be you know much more. Uh, in the way of uh, significant participants in this tournament, uh, given the the nature of it, but uh, but I think you you know you still have to look at uh, the combination of talent, um, technical ability, and uh, tournament experience, and I think uh, the teams that I mentioned probably have uh, have uh, the, all those things combined. All right, uh, June 10th, can't come fast enough. My favorite tournament on the calendar every four years. Alf, I do thank you for your insight as always, and uh, hopefully we'll touch base uh, with, uh, with more Italy news down the line. Sure, my pleasure. Thanks, uh, Dwayne. Thanks for the opportunity. Cheers. You are listening to Soccer Today, live on SPN Radio. Give us a call. Studio line 929-477-3874. You heard the man. Give us a call, 929-477-3874, to talk about anything you want. You can talk about the Javinko stuff. Are, are MLS fans being hypersensitive, or uh, is Conte uh, being a little bit stubborn and old-world arrogant here, folks? We'd love to hear your opinion, uh, who you think is going to win the Champions League, what, you wanna, what you're looking forward to Saturday, what you're looking forward to in the Euros. You can talk about the U.S. roster at, uh, at the Copas. Uh, you can talk about the Albanian roster at the Euros if you want, Kevin. Yeah, that's my big question. That's the hot take of the day. What do you think about the Albanian roster? Sure, you can call if you want to talk about that or talk about anything you would like. Any 
preference who's going to win on Saturday? The White Madrid or the Red and White Madrid? Which one is your favorite? 929-477-3874. All right. Uh, well, we, uh, well, we wait to see if anyone uh, anyone's feeling brave enough to, to call and talk to us today. We'll, uh, we'll have a little bit of a chat about, about Italy. And as I said to Elf, I have never – the Italians are usually pretty um, confident, we'll call it, okay? Uh, they, they tend to, to be very proud people uh, that, that love their team. They love the Azuri. Um, and you can understand why. Uh, I know a lot of Italians, and uh, God love them. They're always ready to tell you how they're going to win every major tournament. But this tournament, they almost found English. They, they, they're already dismissing their chances, and it's just a unique situation for me to see. And I'm not too sure why, uh, because Italy always has this ability in my mind to find a way to grind its way through tournaments, unless it completely crashes it. That happens too. But generally that happens when they're all excited and they think that their chances are at their top level. Uh, how do you see Italy's uh, tournament playing out, uh, Kevin? Italy, I think it's going to be tough for them to achieve anything. But it's always the story with Italy. Whenever they achieve great results or get to a final of a World Cup or of a Euro, like we have seen recently... You know, we never expect them to get there, but they always find a way to get there. So we always dismiss them at the beginning. Then they always struggle with first and second game. In the third game, they usually get the result that they need, just barely enough to get out. But then when it comes knockout stage, they get the job done. They get that result. If it goes to extra time or penalties, they win. They get through. And then momentum starts to build. And then the pressure and... The hype and the ecstasy and the happiness and the glory comes and it builds and it goes from round to round. That's usually a typical Italian tournament. It's going to be interesting to see if in a 24 team Euro they can do the same or maybe even, I was going to say start on a better foot, but they do have Belgium to start the tournament. So it's going to be hard to start on a good foot against maybe one of the top two, three teams in this whole tournament. Exactly. Um. Yeah, Italy. I I think that they are probably in trouble, and I wonder whether I don't I don't know. I can't put a finger on exactly what it is or why it is that that this is a, that a lower generation, a, a generation that that might be crashing out, that might be uh might be at the back end of things, not really ready to to compete. Uh, I I'm just disappointed myself. Uh, speaking at a personal level, that that my favorite uh, player, my favorite Italian by far, Mario Baltelli, uh, won't be on this roster because God, Mario was fun. I miss Mario. Mario, come back. Come back to the world football prominence while you can, you get your stuff together just enough, not too much, but just enough so that you can be back in the headlines consistently because we all miss you, Mario. I miss Mario. No, exactly, right? He was uh, giving at least attention, storyline, drama, and, well, fun. He was bringing fun to the game because he is having fun when he's playing usually. That's, he's playing his best is when he's having fun. So, no, you're right. We, we, miss, we miss you, Super Mario. Super Mario, come back, eh? Come back. It's a me, Mario. I still have my Why Always Me t-shirt that I wear occasionally. Um, it gets some <laughs> funny looks. I was wearing my Why Always Me t-shirt out and about. Like, with just Normally, I wear it under stuff because it's, it's four years old now. So, it's getting, uh, getting on. I might have to retire it soon. But I was wearing it out get without a new one. Uh, anything over it the other day. Yeah, well, they're kind. Of, I don't know how easy it would be to get a new one at this point. They don't. The city store is not exactly selling them anymore. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, this lady literally ran across the street to, to say, "I want one for my husband. I want one for my husband. Where can I get one?" And I had to explain the whole thing to her. I think she started. Her eyes started to glaze over about halfway through the conversation. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, all right. Uh, if you want to t- touch base with us on Twitter. Uh, at 24th minute, that's numerical 24 th minute at Cavalier May at Sports Pod Net. Uh, if you want to do that as well, we can uh, address your questions that way. Uh, as always, uh, you can email us too, Kevin. If you want to give the emails, we won't get them until after the show, but feel free. You can send us a long email. Yeah, there's um, a, and, and also, uh, I was going to say the Sports Podcasting Network at gmail.com. And there's the Patreon, uh, the 
crowdfunding aspect of the network where with your donation we're able to get the microphone that you hear us now talking on get the new live capabilities outside of blog talk radio as well for open lines after dark for as well as the mls post game show all the shows here we have now in studio an actual switchboard and all that and that thanks to your donation so if you want to join the movement help us achieve our vision help us grow help us do more of those live shows patreon that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash sports podcasting network a dollar a month two dollar a month it helps us greatly and if you go with the full pledge the full dive ten dollars a month subscription to the patreon you will have a jump in front of everybody when we have a big phone line queue you will be as a insider able to jump the line Dwayne. so give us a hand give us support patreon.com slash sports podcasting network all right i don't want to belabor the the um you know channel two uh uh, playing uh, Doctor Who repeats, asking you for money stuff on uh, you know public television uh, too much here. But if you do want to give us an individual donation, a single time donation, you 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 know you don't think you can go month to month. That's that's also obviously appreciated greatly. You can hey, do you, it through my uh, my PayPal. Which, sorry, Dwayne, I was going to say there's always my the, PayPal. Oh, I apologize. Go ahead, Dwayne. I'm <laughs> just trying to get my PayPal address out at DG Rollins. So that's D-G-R-O-L-L-I-N-S at gmail.com if you want to give a single donation. Kevin, go ahead and finish your thought. The single donation aspect is possible on Patreon as well. Just give one month and you cancel right after and it'll be just a one-month donation as well. Yeah, all right. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a planning before we go back and, and finish with maybe some MLS talk today, uh, June 6th is the date that we have circled for uh, going potentially uh, daily. Now, what we're, our plan is right now is that June Mondays and Fridays will remain our two solitudes day. Uh, two solitudes on Mondays, two S extra on Fridays. Those will be podcasts that you will have the option of listening to as we record. Uh, but there won't be call-ins for those shows. However, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, the plan is to have call-ins in there. And during uh, the Copas and the Euros, we will be going uh, five times a week. Uh, you know, daily is the wrong way to put it because I, I don't think we're ready to give the weekend up just yet. Uh, we will be asking you for your support during that month so that we can continue it after that. We're going to give you, you know, without any expectation, we're going to show you what we're going to do with the support. We'll set a target to, to meet that, to get there, and that's, that's what we're going to do moving forward because I know that a lot of you want daily coverage, and I'm just going to be blunt that to provide you daily coverage, weekday coverage, it requires a degree of support from you, not necessarily millions, but enough that we can justify it and justify not doing other stuff that do pay our bills. So that is why we're asking for it. We're not greedy. We're just being realistic and being upfront about exactly what would be required. So that's on that note, leave it for today though, Kevin, and let's go and talk a little bit about uh, Major League Soccer right now. Um, we talked about the funk Montreal was in yeah. in the last show on Two Salt Suits this past week. Uh, let's just continue that conversation because it was kind of broken up into three different parts uh, on last day's show. And if you want to download that off iTunes and all the normal places, go ahead, please do. But uh, let's go back, Kevin, and get your, your fuller thought. Uh, are, how concerned are you right now about the impact and whether or not they can drag themselves out of what is now a is it six or is it five? It's six games without a win. It started with the Toronto, the, the Toronto win, the Montreal defeat at home, then four draws, then the Orlando defeat. So six games without a win for Montreal. It is a funk, but if you look at the one thing that's consistent throughout those games, it's the amount of chances on net by the Montreal Impact. It's the amount of shots generated towards the target by the Montreal Impact, by Piatti, by Alduro, by Vinegas on Tavaro last game. Piotti had the goal three and a half minutes in against Orlando, but had about 10 of the chances that were either blocked or saved by the goalkeeper. So the chances are there. It's a question of matter of time before the ball breaks the plane and creates a goal. It's going to happen. We're not worried because you see the chances being created. There's a certain... Uh, disconnect between Drogba and the rest of the team on the pitch in that last phase of play because they're trying to get the ball to him too early, that will be corrected. But the chances, even outside of Drogba, are being created. So I'm not worried in that aspect. I'm just worried defensively. They are not necessarily able to keep 
clean sheets this year. It's not on Evan Bush. It's on the back line. And it's been a carousel at the back line because of injuries. Even now, because of international duties and injuries, you're looking at a back line that's basically Wondre La Five. Because Tony Toya is injured, he's a few weeks from coming back. You have Ambrose Oyongo gone with Cameroon for two friendlies. You have Laurent Simon gone with the Belgium national team. Asun Kamara just came back from injury, but he just came back from injury. Victor Cabrera hasn't been the same confidence and awareness-wise since his big knock a few months and a half ago. So you're looking at a backline left of one little five. So it's that's where the question lies, in my opinion, for the Montreal Impact. Do they have to address the situation in the few weeks from now with the transfer market reopening for MLS in the summer window? Is it time to do so? There's no rumblings, but it might be the questioning, and that's what they're asking themselves right now. Should we do something about this? problem, this conundrum, and maybe even get a number 10 too, because every ship hasn't fulfilled expectation. Let's be honest, he hasn't found the quick chemistry that they had for the first two games, then something changed, they maybe changed, trying to change him, maybe he should back to playing the way he knows, I don't know, but the expectation hasn't been met there, so they need a 10, and they need badly a back line right now. The ship is interesting, and let's talk about him real quickly before we uh, we move on. And again, that number, if you want to give us a call quick, we have about 10 minutes left uh, before we'll shut it down if we don't have any calls, 929-477-3874. But ship is a player that, that let's face it, let's be blunt about this for a second. Chicago did, in fact, give up on him, even though he was a crowd favorite, even though he was from the area. They did give up on him. And there had to be a reason, technically, when they had the new management come in there, that, that they did that. Um, what I had heard is that maybe uh, there were some people that thought that he was uh, not well, exactly not technical enough, that he wasn't necessarily a player that, that could bring the highest level of athleticism or be able to provide a high, high, high level of technical ability to play in a system that was more geared that way. Are, are you, do you feel confident that Chip can find a place on the impact or are you getting concerned about whether or not this might be a player that um, peaked in, in his rookie season? No, I do feel he can find a spot with the impact. We've seen what he can do in his first two games of the club this year with Nacho Piatti when the club won, well, scored six goals in two games. We have seen that from Ship just a few months ago. So I'm not worried that Ship can bring this. It's maybe more an adjustment period of finding his actual role with the club. What type of play should he do in the system? The system cannot be built around him. And when he just started, just came in with the club, that's where he was successful. So that tells you that when he didn't know anything about the system, he came here and was successful playing the way he was playing. But the coaches and the staff were maybe not uh, 100% happy with the rest of his work on the pitch which is the one thing that's not flashy that the people don't see. And in the system, that's what we're talking about. So ball recuperation and all that, that they want maybe a number 10 to do. So that all being said, the more he was accustomed to the Montreal Impact ways to do soccer on a grass pitch, the less effective he has become. So again, that reminding that you cannot build the whole team around the player like Ship. You need to adjust Ship's role to fit the need of the team. They haven't found that need yet. They haven't found that fit. And I've talked to uh, Jonathan Tannerwald last week on the post-game show, and we talked about Harry Ship, and he was saying, Harry Ship is the type of player that likes to pass the ball, to give the ball, to create, to do things with it, and he likes to play in the midfield. So they should change the role that they do have with the number 10 of supporting the, the attack and being almost the aggressor with the ball, Piatti-wise, and more of him focusing on distributing P to Piatti and to Drogba. So maybe that's the answer to all, but he needs to be comfortable in the impact system and still doesn't seem to be the case. All right. Uh, game tonight, of course, as well, to move past the impact, uh, Orlando and Philadelphia. Uh, interesting battle there in the um, in the least conference, as we're, we're calling it now. Uh, that is something that always I'm curious about, Kevin. I wonder what your theory is. Why are Eastern conferences uniformly the weaker conferences within all of North American sports right now, including MLS? Do you have any theories on that, or is it just random? Could it be because in a free agency world over the years, over the last 30 years, 
people have been smart enough and moved where it was warmer. Could that be the the answer to that question? It, yeah, maybe. Maybe in the other sports, yeah. Well, uh, even uh, soccer, if you have a sense. choice between living in Philadelphia and Chester or playing for a Galaxy, Seattle, Vancouver, Portland, which still doesn't have a winter in my books, so choice is not that hard, Dwayne. Yeah, I suppose. I, see, I'm an East Coast guy, though. Like, I, I just, I, the West Coast, like, I can appreciate it's pretty and it's warm, but it just it doesn't doesn't speak to me in the same way that the East Coast, that kind of East Coast grab the world by the, you know, what sort of uh, feeling about it. That's that's my personality. But maybe the other thing I've always thought of, too, when, when you go outside, because MLS, is, I think it might be random in MLS uh, because there's not a lot of free agency, but you do have, you know, outside signings. There, there's that element of it. You're right. And, and certainly the Galaxy, um, are, are the team that most people know, and it doesn't help that New York, the Red Bulls, were incompetently run for many years when they were the Metro Stars, and they weren't able to, to sort of have an East Coast uh, place where, where free agents would be, um, like world free agents would be attracted to. But it, outside of that, I've always wondered whether the old money that runs uh, Eastern Conference teams, and it generally is because they're big media markets, you have to have a lot of money, like you know MLSC here in Toronto, it has to have a lot of money behind it to, to operate. So that maybe have an inherent conservatism to them that doesn't allow the Eastern teams to, to excel. But that's uh, getting off topic from soccer, though, Kevin. No, exactly. Again, 929-477-3874. Give us a line to predict who will win the Champions League on Saturday, too. If you are a Madrid fan, let us know because, well, it's Madrid versus Madrid. So let us know. You cannot choose Madrid. You have to be more clever than that, people. Come on specific it's, it's real versus athletic <laughs> exactly um, don't go to it. sports to select sport or to your sports book and say hey i put the house on madrid no it's not gonna work <laughs> fair enough uh hell you want to talk to me about the raptors you can do that on twitter though but uh anyway uh speaking of which i'm getting nervous about that kevin right tonight you oh, never know right be game uh imagine I'm if the ask- raptors win Imagine I, no, I, oh, I, yeah, I, I, I'm speechless. We'll take it about it because it's it's getting it's six games win away right now. But I never, until believe it or not, watching Oklahoma City win last night to take a three one lead in that series was the first time during this playoff run that I started to think about the possibility, however slight, of the Toronto <laughs> Raptors standing in confetti at the end of things. Toronto, Oklahoma in the final, it. and Toronto beats Oklahoma. The fluke where San Antonio, Golden State, Cleveland have been knocked out, Toronto slips by and wins the whole damn thing. Yeah, that started to cross. I mean, we're talking about, like, we're talking about in the Women's World Cup, the bring us back to soccer. I, I test people off by calling <laughs> The Canada 1%. And then I mathematically showed where I was getting that from, and, and it turns out that I was overestimating their chances. But nonetheless, I, I suspect that the Raptors are at that 1%. But, you know, to steal Jim Carrey's line, I'm saying there's a chance. <laughs> there's a chance for the Knicks, guys, or the 76ers. The hey, Raptors, I, however, have a 1% chance. I have a question for you, Dwayne. Who wins the championship? Yeah. Who wins? Ninety the... seconds. Yeah, who wins the championship first? Who, who's gonna win? Yeah, no, a uh, championship you first. It... The Raptors or TFC? Oh wow! Um, I would say that it's more likely TFC would win a championship because I could see TFC making a playoffs, and if they're healthy, they could win a championship this year. And there's just more randomness wow. within within Major League Soccer. It's really hard in basketball. It's especially really hard in basketball when you don't have a superstar. And it's especially hard to get a superstar in Toronto. Like, 60 the Raptors, seconds. Best chance to get a superstar will come when Andrew Wiggins becomes a free agent. He is a Toronto boy. Uh, he was a Raptors fan. There might be a little bit more um, open-mindedness to coming up to Canada at that particular point to coming to Toronto. But by and large, when you're talking about a Durant or someone like that coming in, it, it's a bit fiction, right? So it's hard to conceptualize the Raptors winning a championship and in many ways that's what's making this so stressful right now they're six games away there may never six be, wins away yeah there may never be a more perfect storm to allow them to win a title than right now so even though i think it's only one percent and even though it's been a great run and it's so much fun and i'm looking forward to tonight i've actually been banned from my apartment 
Um, I'm not allowed to watch the game in the apartment tonight because I almost got us evicted in the last game. So anyway, the, that's uh, that's fun stuff there. Uh, there's ten, 10 seconds, seconds. for the top of the hour. So uh, we, we've, unless there's a call coming in in the next few minutes, we will start to wrap it up now. Uh, Kevin, I, I, one quick thing, just a few housekeeping things quick. We, we already went with all the money and all that jazz and what our plan is going forward. But one other thing I wanted to get out there before uh, we say goodbye today is that uh, I am on the hunt for people that want to be correspondents during the Euro and during Copas. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be there, but certainly if you are over there, let us know if you are willing and, and able and, and interested in taking a phone call from us and sharing your insights. From a fan perspective, it doesn't have to be anything over the top. We just want to include people in this and have a North American-wide conversation about these tournaments that matter to us. So if you're interested in that, give us a shout at all the various platforms that we listed before, uh, uh, Sports Podcast. Sorry, what's the email again, Kevin? I always forget the emails because you handle them. SportsPodcastingNetwork at gmail.com. Exactly. Or you can leave my personal email, even like GG Rollins at, uh, or sorry, Dwayne G. Rollins, uh, D U A N E G R O L O I N S at uh, gmail.com or Kevlar May or, or whatever you want off the woodworks. There's lots of different ways to get a hold of us, and we put them out there all the time. So just let us know. And uh, we would love to set that up for uh, those near daily shows, that five time weekly shows that we will be doing during the Euros and the Copas, Kevin. So, do you have any final thoughts before, uh, before we say goodbye to, to this penultimate uh, pilot edition of Soccer Today? Well, again, you mentioned earlier, like the planning for the thing. When we want to do shows that have open lines, the best capabilities and the best option for the callers is what you are listening to right now. It's not ideal, we know. The audio quality live is not ideal, we know. But the switchboard in the callers permits more than one caller to call at a time and has a better capabilities for all parties involved during that live radio call. Outside of that, when me and Dwayne or myself do solo live shows, we can do them in a, a lot more high-quality audio type of fashion. And that's on the YouTube page of SPN Radio. Just type SPN Radio on YouTube. You will find the page. Subscribe, and you will find the high-quality live sports radio shows that you crave. For the open line shows, it will be here on blogtalkradio.com slash SPN Radio. And for both of them, you can find them, as always, on sportspodcastingnetwork.com slash SPN Radio. And All right, and on that note, Kevin, I will say goodbye, and you can uh, wrap the show up as you always do. Have a great soccer. You were listening to SPN, the Sports Podcasting Network. Visit us, sportspodcastingnetwork.com.